Hey, hey Kelsey. Kelsey. How's it going? Great. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Nice. So it looks like you've got some some sun where you are. It's been I know. Off, off raining here <laughs> in Portland. <laughs> It was just raining like 30 minutes ago, so I'm I'm fingers crossed that the weather window holds nice. for a while. Yeah, good timing. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Always nice to do these outside, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I was uh, out earlier with my boys and had a had a good good morning. Nice, nice. Get outside. Um, great. Well, I guess we, we might as well get started. Um, yeah, yeah, like I men mentioned before, I'm, I'm Katrina. I'm on the Filson marketing team and uh, sitting down here with Amy and from American Rivers. And Amy, you want to just give us a little intro on who you are and what you do and what American Rivers is? Yeah, you bet. Well, thanks for having me, um, Katrina. It's great to, great to see you and Super grateful to have a chance to, to chat today and also grateful for Filson, um, who's been a longtime supporter of American Rivers. So thank you. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Amy Kober. I'm the VP for Communications at American Rivers. We're a national nonprofit river conservation organization. Um, I'm talking to you from Portland, Oregon, uh, but we've got staff uh, across the country. Our headquarters are in Washington, D.C., and we have offices across the country. Nice. Nice. And uh, yeah, I guess for the audience who do isn't familiar with the work that you guys do, can you tell us a little bit more about what a national organization of river conservation means and does? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> so at the, at the heart of what we do is we believe life needs rivers. Um, and I think, you know, I'd ask everyone watching to think about what, what that means for you personally. Um, maybe you care about the safe, clean drinking water you have in your home, the, the coffee you made this morning or the beer you might drink later today is, <laughs> is made from clean water. Mm -hmm. um, we're, all, we're all at home right now, and I think a lot of us are really excited for that first trip we can take. Um, I know I'm really excited to, to get out with my family and do some river trips. I don't know if we can this summer or not, but that's an important part of our life, uh, the, the recreation and outdoor opportunities that rivers give us. And our communities need healthy rivers. Rivers are where so many of our cities and towns grew up on. We, we, we founded um, cities and towns on the banks of rivers. And today, rivers are so important for our local economies, local businesses, our quality of life. So for us, every day, what drives us is this belief that life needs rivers. And mm -hmm. it's, it's super simple, but also um, incredibly <laughs> important and, and complex. Yeah. Absolutely. What um, what drew you to American Rivers? I mean, what was your background? How did you become the director of or VP of communications there? Yeah, well, I've been at the organization for a really long time. I feel incredibly lucky. Um, I love my job. I love the people I work with. And what drew me here were I, I was always interested in, in environmental issues, conservation issues. I have a writing. Um, I was an English major background. So uh, finding American Rivers was amazing because I could combine these two interests. And it's um, it's just a wonderful place to work. I mean, the river community is such an incredible group of people, not just my colleagues at American Rivers, but mm -hmm. there are so many amazing local river organizations across the country. Um, we have so many incredible partners. And it's just every day I'm I'm fired up and inspired by the people I work with. Amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, on that on that point, I mean, you guys work with so many organizations, so many different constituents as you work on these river projects. Um, what would you say is American Rivers primary role in that? I mean, are you guys mediating conversation? Are you actually boots on the ground restoring some of these watersheds or? Yeah. Uh, so the, the unique thing about American Rivers is we bring whatever it takes to save the river. Um, and to help the community solve its problems. And so we have staff out in the field doing field work. Um, my colleague April is managing a construction crew up on the Middle Fork Nooksack River near Bellingham to remove a dam. We have staff who are in the halls of Congress. We have policy expertise, technical expertise. Um, but, so we bring this really rich um, toolkit and because rivers and water issues are some of the most complex in the world. And they're all interconnected. You can't solve a river problem without solving 10 other problems that are connected. Yeah. So our staff um, 
Our staff brings a wide range of expertise. And we also partner with a wide range of, of other groups because, you know, don't listen to any, anyone who tells you that, you know, they can take credit for any one success. I mean, mm -hmm. all of our successes are because of partnership and collaboration. That's the only way to get things done. And so in a lot of cases, we are following the lead of frontline organizations who have been addressing these, these issues for a long time. Um, Native American tribes are in the forefront of, you know, the, look at the Nez Perce tribe and their efforts to, to save salmon. Um, the lower Elwha Klallam tribe was in the forefront of removing the Elwha Dam. So yeah, partnership is key. And, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that American Rivers, that, that so much uh, positive change around rivers and clean water has, has sprang from our organization. Um, if you look at, so we're, we're coming up on about, well, we're close to our 50 year anniversary. And wow. <laughs> that's, uh, I think three or that's four incredible. Four years. Yeah. So if you think about it, 20 or 30 years ago, the idea of removing a dam was crazy. Yeah. It's the most radical thing you can think of. I mean, read the monkey wrench gang by Edward Abbey. It was like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and over 20 years, we've managed to make it a acceptable mainstream tool for mm -hmm. restoring a river, improving public safety, helping a company's bottom line. So that's in large part because of American Rivers and, and the work that uh, my colleagues have done over the years. And is the work that you guys are doing, is it primarily approaching these problems you know would you say the majority of the rivers that you guys are dealing with and handling like the dam is the biggest issue and dam removal is like the biggest thing you guys fight for or is it, there yeah it really, else it depends on depends on the river um sure i mean dams and dam removal are a big a big piece of what we do but we also mm -hmm. we're we're fighting on the national level right now for critical bedrock clean water protections that have been in place since the Clean Water Act for 50 years almost. And now the Trump administration is rolling them back. And that impacts every river and stream and wetland in the country. Um, so a lot of our work is like river specific. And then a lot of our work is on the, on the federal and state level, um, looking at the laws and policies that really impact everybody's river. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of that, I and mean, that's, that's so true. And there's so many, I'm sure there's so many issues out there and so many places to start, you know, and it's, I know you guys produce your um, most in America's most endangered rivers report, which helps you sort of prioritize. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how that process works? And yeah, so every year for about 35 years, we've been releasing America's Most Endangered Rivers, which is a list of 10 rivers facing urgent threats. Um, it's not just about sounding the alarm, though. Uh, we do highlight threats and terrible things that could happen, but we also highlight solutions. So yeah. the reason for the report is to, is to look at key actions that each of these rivers need and focus on the decision makers who can make these things happen. So the report really has a great track record of, um, of saving rivers. And, and again, it's about partnership because we, we team up with local partners on each river um, to, they, they nominate rivers and we select them. And the, we release the list every spring, every April. Um, it's our biggest media event of the year. It, the, the report release comes with a, a very lengthy, uh, communications planning effort. And this year was really interesting because the way the, the timing works, we have the rivers chosen in January, February, and then the real work begins. Um, we are just pulling it, we're writing the report, we're pulling all the assets together, we're having planning calls with our partners every day. Um, so that all happens in early March. Mm -hmm. Our office is closed on March 13th and yeah. we're working from home. And it, you know, it, we all know, <laughs> we all know what that's been like over the past couple months. Um, so we really had to do a lot of soul searching. Um, we got questions from our partners. Are you still doing this? Are you still releasing this report? Some of them thought we shouldn't. I mean, some people, some people said it's going to sound, you're going to be look tone deaf if you release this report during this awful virus while people are dying. And, and it was, 
and, and, and then the other piece of it was, well, will anyone even pay attention? Yeah. Will a river story even resonate when all of the news is about coronavirus? So we did a lot, a lot of discussion internally. And we looked at our options. Um, we, we thought about postponing it, but then until when? Yeah, right. <laughs> until June, until July. And, and we decided after a lot of discussion that we were gonna stick with the original release date of April 14th, because not just because this is a really important thing for American rivers, but it's because rivers and clean water still matter. And the more we thought about it and, and, and looked at our, our story, two things really became clear. One, um, in, in terms of the pandemic, the pandemic has exposed longstanding injustices and vulnerabilities in our water system. What's the one thing health officials are telling us to do every day? Wash our hands, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is millions of people in this country don't have clean running water in their homes, rural and urban areas, both. So we realized we had our, one of our responsibilities uh, was to connect the dots between clean water and healthy rivers and strong, healthy communities. So that was the first piece that kind of spurred us to like, though, that we really need to do this. Yeah. Uh, the second piece was the top three rivers on the list this year are all threatened by flooding and climate change. So the upper Mississippi, the lower Missouri and the big sunflower. Well, okay, so flooding is, it can be a disaster at any time, but what happens when these communities have a flood in the middle of a pandemic? You're supposed to stay at home. They can't they leave, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you go, is there, you know, is there an emergency shelter that you can go to that's not gonna be super crowded? A lot of the ways that communities um, fight flooding is they, they, all their neighbors turn out, it's a massive volunteer effort and they stack sandbags. Well, mm -hmm. how do you do that when you're supposed to stay six feet away from each other? So yeah. we realized that we had actually a lot to say that was very relevant immediately to people's lives, the public health and well-being. And so we stuck with our release date of April 14th, um, but we also were, were really flexible and creative in terms of evolving our messaging. Um, and, you know, if local partners didn't think that this was the right thing for them to do, we said, that's fine. Um, we can be, you can, we can tell this story together year round, right? Yeah. So yeah. Don't feel like you have to do it on April 14th. But um, long story short, it was one of the most successful, most endangered rivers releases we've ever had, which wow. uh, still surprises me because um, I was, you know, just really worried about the, the public's bandwidth and ability to, to focus on this. But I think, number one, it's because rivers and clean water do matter and people care. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's, that's a good thing that, that um, they are top of mind for people. And then two, I think people really want actions they can take. And this yeah. is about action. It's about positive change. And no, we can't, we can't, we all feel kind of powerless right now about a lot of things, but we can take action for the rivers and clean water that matter so much to us. So. Yeah. And it's amazing to see that you guys have had that. I mean, that message is really resonating with people right now and that it's been, you know, the most successful report to date. And you know, one of the things that, you know, we and I, you and I talked about before was, um, you know, number one on the list, the, the Mississippi Delta. Um, what, can you kind of talk about that river specifically and what, what's going on and, um, you know, sort of the, the problems that you guys are seeing there? Yeah, so, yeah, so the upper Mississippi is number one. And the issue there is that we've we've channelized and, and managed this river for decades to get the water off the landscape as quickly as possible, get it downstream as quickly as possible. And the more, if you build taller and taller levees, you're, you're almost making the flooding worse because, and, and it, this is a kind of an issue of justice in a lot of cases because the more wealthy communities have the funds and the resources to build these higher levees and then they push the floodwaters on the less wealthy communities that don't have the ability to build the levees and yeah it's just this downward spiral of destruction um what we need to do 
is we need to give the river room to flood safely. Floods are going to happen. They've always happened. It's a fact of life if you live on a river. And with climate change, they're happening more and they're happening, they're getting bigger. Mm -hmm. so we can create space along the river to give the river room to move that protects people and property. And so we need this comprehensive look at how we're managing um, the river and, and the whole watershed. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's, there's, this is happening. Um, the, the California Central Valley is a great example of where we're starting to see that kind of better management that gives you, it's called multi-benefit flood management, where it gives you lots of benefits, not just flood protection, but it gives you wildlife habitat and it recharges groundwater, which is good for clean water supply. And it gives you parks and green space for families to go have fun outside. So you can do this in a way that um, that solves lots of problems at once. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's really about, to your point, you know, finding the natural flow of that river, diverting it where it needs to go and mitigating that those those flood events, you know, for lack yeah. of a better term. Yeah, well, and it, it kind of speaks to like our historical evolution in our society of just how we've like the best use of a river. I mean, it used to be that the best thing that you could do with the river would be to dam it and divert it and channelize it and dump your waste into it. And that was that was progress, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now we know better. And we've seen we've seen the downside of that approach. And now we can now we can do not do that. Um, yeah. Protect and restore our rivers. And we know that that gives us all kinds of benefits. Yeah, amazing. And then we, you know, one of the things I'd love to hear from you, there's obviously there's a lot of um, challenges in the work you guys do. Um, what's the project that's most firing you up right now? Um, gosh, there are so many. Um, I would say one of the most, one of the most interesting and exciting ones is our, is, is the work on the Lower Snake River. Um, the, the Columbian Snake Rivers in the Pacific Northwest um, were the number one salmon rivers in the world. And the snake contributed most of the Columbia River's salmon and steelhead historically. And it is we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to bring these salmon back. So the dams on the Lower Snake, there are four of them. They're in Eastern Washington. They were built in the late sixties and early seventies. And they provide benefits. They provide uh, transportation to their lock and dam structures. Um, they provide hydropower and some irrigation. They've also been responsible for a massive decline in salmon returns. and. The, um, the, the, the phrase snake river salmon is really not great. It's, it's very limiting. And I was, I was actually thinking about um, who, who has written about the snake river in the most compelling ways. And I was remembering the author, um, David James Duncan, who wrote books like The River Why and My Story is Told by Water. Um, look him up if you haven't read his books. They're really great. Yeah, but definitely. He, he talks about um, how this, the lower snake is he says it's just the salmon's gate. It's not their vast wild palace. Because you think about the tributaries, it's rivers in Oregon, like the, the Lostine, um, the, um, the Powder, the Grand Ronde. It's all the rivers in Idaho from the Salmon, the Clearwater, the Loxa, rivers and tributaries in Washington. So this is, this is the best salmon recovery opportunity we have in the lower 48. So the, the, the cool and complicated thing about this, this possible dam removal effort, this river restoration effort, is that all of these issues, I think I mentioned before, that all these things are connected. Mm -hmm. And here in the Pacific Northwest, you can't solve the salmon problem without solving clean energy and agriculture and transportation. They're all connected. So that makes this really complicated, but it also makes it really fantastic and and because all these values matter to us i mean we're yeah. a station you know sure we, we care about salmon but of course we care about clean energy of course we care about strong agriculture um and strong local economies across our region of course mm -hmm. so there's this emerging conversation in the region um spurred by a number of factors um one is the 
the um, the Bonneville Power Administration and their future um, mm -hmm. and what that looks like. One is the plight of the southern resident uh, killer whales who depend on Chinook salmon uh, in large part from the Columbia snake to survive. So a lot of these factors have come together and this issue has been around, you know, I've been working on this issue for as long as I've worked at American Rivers. So it's been around for a long time. Yeah. New opportunity is here before us now. And the question is, can we all come together to keep our values front and center and look for solutions that bring, move everyone forward together? Um, we can't stay in our old corners and just fight the way these, these fights have been you know, going on for years. It's not productive and it's not gonna get us anywhere. Yeah, now's the time to sort of, um, yeah, I was, I was thinking about this a lot recently. It's like, you almost have like this reset moment, you know, and especially for environmental restoration and conservation. And it's like, you know, now's the time to be finding these creative solutions and um, bringing, you know, lots of different stakeholders together. And I think that that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, For sure. And I mean, it's one of the things I think American Rivers does best. Um, and we, we have a track record of doing that. And um, not that, not that these examples I'm going to share are like all that similar to the lower snake, but it's, it's about finding those solutions. So, you know, look at the Penobscot River in Maine, where American Rivers and our partners removed dams, and we actually kept hydropower production on in that watershed the same. Because mm -hmm. while we removed dams, we could also change the operations of existing dams that remained. So it's about getting creative. And yeah, we can do that. Um, we've, we've done it before. And we're, that's what we do. We're committed. Yeah. To the process. <laughs> that's why you guys have been around for the last <laughs> 50 years. I mean, pretty incredible. Um, I'm going to take some questions. There have been a few questions that have come in. First of all, um, someone has mentioned that they live by the Fraser River, um, which was had the same issue last year. Do you have you guys done any work on the Fraser or is that on the list? Uh, the Fraser in Canada? Um, I think the Frasers in Canada, we, we, we tend to focus on U.S. rivers. Um, but the Fraser is an absolutely important river um, for salmon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Here's another question. Oh, not a question. <laughs> it's a comment. <laughs> um, oh, this is an interesting one. So, um, and, you know, I, I might, I might kind of tweak it a little bit, but um, you know, I know it's something that we talk a lot about in, in especially the Pacific Northwest is this concept when you're in sort of salmon restoration mode um, of wild versus hatchery or wild versus wild um, strains and species versus non-native. Um, do you have, do you guys have a position on that or is that more I mean, not really not, in your realm? Yeah, we're not, we're not a a fish organization. I mean, there are other groups um, that I would, I would point people to for, you know, to get into that, like Trout Unlimited, Native Fish Society. Um, I mean, others have resources around that. We, we tend to focus on, we need healthy rivers. Mm -hmm. All fish and all yeah. people need healthy <laughs> rivers. And so that's, that's our main focus is protecting and restoring the rivers so that, um, so that we can have, we can have all fish, you know, into the future. But for sure, um, you know, wild, wild fish are important. Um, we, mm. that's, if, if you didn't have wild fish, you know, that's, that's where, that's where you can get hatchery fish. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you, we've got to protect, um, got to protect the wild runs that we still have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of the, um, a few other river shout outs here, the MF Nooksack. Yeah, the Middle Fork Nooksack. So this Middle is a, Fork Nooksack. I was like, I was hoping you knew what the MF stood for. This is a, <laughs> this is a really exciting project. So I mentioned my colleague April, who's, who's um, managing that construction crew. This is a dam um, near Bellingham, Washington, and it is the top priority river restoration, Chinook salmon restoration project in Puget Sound, um, like after the Elwha. So wow. the dams came down, and that's been fantastic. It's been an incredible restoration success story so far. 
So, but we need to keep it going. We still have a lot of salmon restoration um, and specifically Chinook because this is what the, the, the killer whales need. That's the Chinook are their kind of bread and butter. They need that in their diet. So the middle fork nook sack is really important for Chinook restoration and, and other, other fish. Um, so the dam is, will be removed this summer. They are mobilizing now, they're getting the site ready. And um, everyone always asks like, was, was, will there be an explosion? <laughs> are you gonna blow it up? <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there will be, I think a small one, um, July or August is, is what we're looking at. And you can be sure that we'll be covering that um, on American Rivers Instagram, so. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned, yeah, but, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've had the fortune of, of seeing a number of dams in person being removed during my time at American Rivers, and it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, I don't know, I mean, if folks remember when Condit Dam um, came down on the White Salmon River about, gosh, many years ago now, mm -hmm. um, there was the big blast and then the reservoir drained really quickly and it was just incredibly dramatic. And there's just something about seeing a river coming back to life that mm -hmm. it, it just gives you chills. Um, yeah. the river, the, when, when a river can flow free for the first time in a hundred years, it's amazing to watch. Yeah. And the other amazing thing about removing dams that don't make sense anymore is that the river comes back so quickly. Um, we, we talk to scientists all the time and, and people who are studying the river following the dam removal and they always express amazement at how quickly, how quickly uh, the river can just rebound and the banks green up and the fish come back. And so, gosh, you know, if we could just let rivers be rivers and sort of almost get out of their way a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, but the other, the other cool thing about the Nooksack is not only are we removing this dam, um, and again, it's a partner effort. The city of Bellingham is involved. The Lummi and the Nooksack tribes are involved. Um, so we're not doing this by ourselves. Right. Um, the other thing on the Nooksack is we're also working to protect it as wild and scenic. And that means federal protection for this river so that it will not be harmed ever by another dam or a harmful water project or bad pollution or anything like that. So um, it really, you can look at the Nooksack as this great example of all the things you can do to help a river um, mm -hmm. you can remove a dam. And, and, it, and related to the dam removal, the dam is actually part of the city of Bellingham's water supply. So that's something we had to fix. We had to do the right that um, before we could remove it. So you can have a sustainable water supply, you can remove a dam and bring the salmon back, and then you can protect the river so that um, it can continue to benefit all of, its, all of the communities along its banks for, for generations to come. Amazing. Yeah, and someone else, you know, speaking of success stories, someone else mentioned um, the Elwa, and the question was, what improvements have been seen since the removal, removal of the, sorry, I just like saw a squirrel run my head. that was so distracting. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit more about the Elwa? Oh yeah, the Elwha. So I love the Elwha. I mean, I um, I used to live in Seattle, and and we would take a lot of trips out to the Olympic Peninsula for hiking and camping, and um, spent so much time on the Elwha River. And I just I remember one hike. I think it was is it Low Divide where you go up the Elwha and then down in Quinault North. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I just right along the river, like all the way. It's yeah. like a ten mile. Yeah, it's amazing. It's so, so that, and this was before, this was while the dams were still in place, mm. like 2006 or something. So mm -hmm. I remember being up above the dams and it's just such a stunning place, old growth forest and clear blue water in the river and just gorgeous. But just remember thinking like something's missing, right? I mean, this, there should be salmon here. This, there yeah. was a fish passage at the Elwha dams. They couldn't get up. So fast forward to today, the dams are gone and the whole ecosystem has come back to life. And it's such a cool study of how you bring back a keystone species like salmon mm -hmm. and everything explodes back to life from the insects to the eagles, to the osprey, to the bears, to the you know elk, like everything all of a sudden, it's because it's all connected and, and, and the threads are of, like the web of life weaving back together. Um, another neat thing on the Elwha is so a dam, it doesn't just stop river, it stops sediment. 
sand and gravel and all of that. And that actually starves the lower river of that. Those are, that's key to the river that yeah. habitat building blocks. So now that the sediment can flow freely down the Elwha, it has totally transformed the beach at the mouth of the river, um, the whole near shore environment. So it used to just be like this moonscape of rocks and cobbles and now it's sandy and um, the whole, <clears throat> um, like I think there's, you know, eelgrass and like all that whole ecosystem has come back. So it's impacting the ocean, um, mm -hmm. that environment too. So it's really been um, amazing to see. If, and uh, the Seattle Times has done a great job of covering that. Linda Mapes is the reporter who's been covering that for years. And she even wrote a book That's about great. it. great. <laughs> really, really great success story. Yeah. Um, another challenging river question um, in the Seattle area, Pacific Northwest. Um, someone's asking about the Duwamish. Um, do you want to talk about, I don't know if you guys do work on the Duwamish or challenges or successes you guys have had there? We actually had a recent success on the Duwamish. Um, so the green and Duwamish rivers were on our endangered rivers list last year. Mm. And the issue there, I mean, I know there are longstanding pollution issues that everybody's, you know, continuing to work on cleaning up. But the issue we were highlighting was the need for a better flood management plan. So back to talking about flooding, it's not just something that happens in the Midwest, um, but we've, we've channelized the green and Duwamish so much. And I actually kayaked on a stretch of the green that like the levees, it was so high. You felt like you were in this like canyon of blackberries. <laughs> just yeah. hot and hot <laughs> river. So we highlighted that last year and the need for um, a better flood management plan that's going to not only restore not only help um, protect people and the communities from flooding but do it in a way that benefits salmon and wildlife and we got a we got a good win recently um i mean the work is ongoing but um that's we we actually have a uh, we did a video with google earth about that issue it's on our website and our blog so you can go check it out there cool what was it more in the was the win more in the removal of that levy no, it's more, it's more um, just local government committing to um, a, a different approach and, Got it. and, and Got it. funding funding a different approach. So a lot of this, that, that's a huge win though. I mean, even though like yeah. actual work might take several years, like getting that commitment sure. of decision makers is absolutely key. Awesome. Um, another com question came through about... Um, it's kind of a broad one, but um, any projects on the East Coast that you can talk about or? Yeah, gosh, so much on the East Coast. Um, yeah. I'll talk about, oh, what to choose. Um, so we just, we're doing a lot of work on the, uh, on the Delaware River. Um, mm. The Delaware River is a great example of clean water solutions. Um, communities, cities like Philadelphia coming together around innovative clean water solutions that benefit all kinds of things, public health, um, enjoyment and access of rivers for people who live in the city, um, climate resilience. So there's a lot of um, work with natural infrastructure um, in cities, managing stormwater in, in ways that benefit people and wildlife. Um, so there's great work going on in the Delaware. We have great work going on um, in the Carolinas uh, when it comes to flood protection, a lot of dam removal work in the Carolinas right now. Um, we're celebrating in Maryland the removal of Bloaty Dam, which happened um, a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. But now the Patapsco River, which flows into the Chesapeake Bay, is um, on the rebound. And so we're, there's, there's work going on nationwide. Um, and... Um, yeah, always, always, a, always a good success story to share. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you guys have so many projects. It's pretty kind of mind blowing, honestly. Um, a question came in about sort of your guys's partnership with the timber industry and, and, you know, if there have been certain projects that you guys have really come together on with, you know, timber, lumber, in terms of, you know, river stewardship? 
Yeah, I would, I would point people to work that um, Pacific Rivers has done um, on that. It's not, we, I just, I can't think of something off the top of my head that's been um, a partnership or work with the timber industry. But I know, you know, of course, healthy forests, forests are where our drinking water comes from. Um, right. so, so many of, so many cities get their water from national forests. And forests work as these amazing filtration systems for clean water. And so protecting, protecting our forests is, is absolutely important um, for all of our drinking water, and let alone, you know, recreation opportunities and all of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, we have, um, I'm just trying to see if there's any more. Um, but, you know, I have one and what's next for American Rivers? Well, where do, you, where do you see the future of the organization, I guess? Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> we, our future, we're, we're working for a future where clean water and healthy rivers are available for everyone everywhere. I mean, that's, that's bold, but, but that's what we're working for. We believe everyone everywhere should have clean water and healthy rivers. And right now, um, our country's in a really uncertain place. We are in the middle of a terrible pandemic. We're in the middle of an awful economic downturn that's hurting everyone, um, especially a lot of communities and businesses that depend on healthy rivers. Mm. So many, so many communities are, are hurting right now because, you know, if you depend on recreation and tourism, if your job is about rivers, um, it's, you know, it's tough. So we are thinking a lot right now, um, we're, we're gonna be releasing a report in June that looks at the economic benefits of healthy rivers and the jobs that, that rivers um, provide. We're also looking at the kinds of infrastructure investments that we need to make sure everyone has clean water. Because as I mentioned before, this pandemic has exposed the fact that there's just incredible injustices when it comes to who gets to have clean water in our country. Yeah. So that is, we're going to be speaking up about that. Um, that's going to be a big focus for us. Um, it is right now and it will be over the summer. And we need to invest in healthy rivers if we want clean water, strong communities, a strong economy. If, if you think back to the Great Depression, um, we built dams to get out of the Great Depression, right? Yeah, and yeah. The Valley, um, Grand Coulee on the Columbia Woody Guthrie sang songs about it. And, and, and in that sense, rivers um, and, and damming rivers w represented opportunity and, and power. And, but now we, we need to look at, a, look at it in a different way. And, and we need to, our, our rivers still represent opportunity and prosperity, um, but we can protect and restore them and we can, we can capture it that way. And so that's what we, that's what we want to talk about um, with, with, decision makers with our partners um, and all of our supporters. And I, I will say too that none of the work that we do is possible without our members and our supporters. We have incredi an incredibly strong um, uh, army of, of, of donors and none of our work is possible without that. And so I guess I would ask everyone listening, if, if you love a river, if you care about rivers and clean water, um, this coming week is a great chance to donate because Giving Tuesday is on May 5th, this Tuesday, um, and Mother's Day is coming up. And so as a mom, as a daughter, I think giving a gift to American Rivers is a great idea. So, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, but, but I, you know, appreciate, appreciate all of our, all of our supporters. Um, and again, Philson for, for all of your support over the years. Yeah, well, and if you guys are, are feeling inclined to give today, uh, in our the Filson Instagram stories, there's a swipe up to um, to donate to American Rivers. And um, yeah, you know, you mentioned Giving Tuesday. You can also check out the um, America's Most Endangered Rivers report on American Rivers website, right? Just right on your guys' homepage. So yep. there's, that's a resource there if you guys want to take a look. And um yeah, I guess on a closing note, I mean, is there, as an individual, what would you say is the biggest thing that you can do to um, kind of protect protect rivers? I'd say a couple things. One, um, speak up, 
know who your decision makers are, know who, know who's making decisions about your river and call them, email them, um, be vocal about your river and your clean water. And then I would say, you know, support a group like American Rivers, um, support your local river organization, your local watershed group. Um, they, they always have wonderful ways you can get involved locally. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much, Amy, for joining us. Uh, this is an amazing conversation. I feel very inspired um, <laughs> to protect our rivers. And, you know, there's so many throughout the country and um, they're so important to, you know, for all the reasons you mentioned. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us. And My pleasure. My pleasure, Katrina. I really appreciate it. Thanks so yeah, much. Enjoy absolutely. Yeah, you too. All right.